Welcome back, everyone. Hope you had a very good lunch. We are about to start the afternoon sessions, two sessions this afternoon. Um, I think we might all be in the room by now, but those who aren't in the room, if they'd like to make their way back into the room, that would be terrific. It looks like the pinball tournament has come to an abrupt end in time for Ray's session. Now, that video you might have just seen there, we shot that last year, and there was a serious reason behind that, because we were doing some outreach trying to encourage people in schools and universities and colleges that telecoms is a very good careers choice. It really, really is. So we were trying to, we asked all, a lot of our guests who are on our live after show programs, we asked them how they got their first job in telecoms. And uh, we're all grateful for their replies. They all got into the spirit of it and uh, told us a lot of stories about how they got into telecoms and why they enjoy this business so much. And no one mentioned bean bags or pinball machines, which was fantastic. Um, we are going to start the session now. So, before I invite Ray onto stage, I'd just like to say, if any one of you in this room wants to sort of pick up on what we've done there and is interested in this kind of outreach stuff and thinks they could do something and we could help them, you know, encourage the next generation of telecoms professionals into our industry, then just come and have a word with us tonight or tomorrow, anytime. Right, without further ado, which is our catchphrase for the week, Ray, please, come on stage, moderate the next session and bring your guests. Thank you, Guy. Let's have a round of applause for the people who have uh, chosen to go after lunch. Well, not, actually, they didn't choose, did they? We put them there, but that's... Uh... So, uh, our next session is entitled Taking 5G to the Edge. Obviously, uh, you know, that topic encapsulates two of the most talked about uh, things in the industry. And there's a great deal of responsibility uh, hanging on the edge, so to speak, not least when it comes to the potential way in which standalone 5G core capabilities are deployed. Uh, but standalone 5G core solutions haven't been put to use as quickly as had been hoped, it would seem. So why is that? That's one of the things we'll explore in this session. And of course, the edge doesn't exist uh, just for 5G core, far from it. Uh, for some, it's even hosting 5G RAN, of course, uh, and now operational and business support systems and enterprise applications with private wireless networking, of course, one reason for the edge to very much exist these days. Uh, but we still face some of the same questions uh, that were asked some time ago uh, about the edge. Uh, how will it be used? whose edge, whose facilities, whose platforms are best placed to meet end user needs? Uh, and how does, this, how does this play into the deployment strategies and partnership strategies of the digital service providers? So, uh, you know, a lot to, to get through and cover in this. And of course, you know, there might be uh, more topics uh, that will come from the show floor and of course from our online audience that is uh, uh, watching through Telecom TV's website. Uh, so, but before we get into to the meat of the action, uh, as with all the other sessions, uh, we have a poll. Um, so let's take a, a quick uh, look at the poll that we've got for this session. And like with the other ones, we're asking people to uh, choose as many options uh, as are relevant uh, in, the, in the selection of answers. So um, if you haven't already uh, been to uh, to vote on this poll, please do, and we'll come to uh, an updated version of the uh, uh, of the responses at the end of this session. As you can see, this isn't showing anything uh, just yet, and that's on purpose. Um, uh, for those in the room, a reminder, because there's a few people who have joined um, uh, since lunchtime, uh, the QR code on the table will take you uh, to the website where you can uh, check out more about this event and the sessions, and then uh, vote in the poll. So it's time to uh, introduce our uh, guests on stage. So we're going to start from my far left. Uh, so we have Graham Wild, who's head of 5G business development at CKH Innovations uh, Opportunities Development. Then we have Henan Garcia, global telecommunications solution manager at Red Hat. Uh, Maria Lemma, co-founder of Weaver Labs. Uh, we have uh, Martin Taylor for his second appearance today uh, from the office of the CTO Azure for Operators at Microsoft. 
and Paul Miller, Chief Technology Officer at Wind River. Now, this session was also due to include uh, Neil McRae from BT, but unfortunately Neil has had to, to step away with, uh, to deal with some, uh, some business, unfortunately, during the course of this session. Um, so unfortunately, he won't be joining this, but he will be joining uh, the session later on uh, this afternoon. So we will have uh, more of Neil's insights uh, then. Uh, as also as part of this session, we have uh, some uh, comments uh, from uh, Mirko Voltolini, who I'm sure many of you know. He's the VP of Strategy and Innovation at Colt Technology. I spoke to him last week. We recorded some comments. He wasn't uh, able to join us in person today, but uh, we'll be getting some insights from him during the course of uh, this session. Um, so, uh, with no, without any further ado, uh, let's get on with, uh, with what we uh, have to talk about here today. Uh, and as I mentioned in the uh, introduction, of course, one of the, the main uh, use cases uh, amongst telecom operators uh, of edge uh, capabilities is to introduce these 5G core functions and have them uh, distributed. But um, it, it would appear that the consensus in the industry is that the deployment of standalone 5G is taking uh, a little bit longer than expected. So are, are there any reasons for this? Is it, a, is it a strategic thing, a technical thing? Is it an edge capabilities thing? Um, so uh, let's, start, uh, let's start from the right here. Uh, Paul, any, any insights into, into why the, the, the 5G core rollout might be a little bit slower than anticipated? Or, in fact, even if that's true? I think it is true, and it's, it's really driven by the emergence of use cases that can make use of a 5G core. And especially as we've gone through the, the COVID period where 4G bandwidth was considered adequate by many people and a bit of network uh, slow rollout occurred you know, during that period of time. We've also seen that the core is driven by the edge and really 5G core really is dependent upon things like C-band or mid-band uh, deployment to happen as well as uh, enablement of use cases that can make use of advanced features like network slicing. And we're just not there yet from a de deployment standpoint. It's taking uh, the industry a bit longer to get that, those services deployed. And as we'll talk about, I think a little bit later, as we look towards the role of virtualization at the edge and how that's gonna play in the applications that may enable the use of network slicing, uh, as well as the edge and OT domain that's really gonna take, take a role in that, um, those things are gonna drive into existence the real need for the 5G core, uh, just unfortunately taking a while to get there. Okay, uh, and Martin, of course, 5G core capabilities, that's something that you've been working on for, for quite some time. Uh, how do you see this uh, playing out and what can maybe help to uh, accelerate uh, the deployment? Yeah, I mean, look, I'm, I'm not sure that we're really behind where we thought we were going to be on this. I mean, it's, this is big and complex technology, for one thing. The operators have been focused, focusing their energies on getting the 5G new radio out there. That in itself was a huge uh, in investment plan. Um, but I think the other thing to remember is that uh, operators generally are expecting their packet core vendors to deliver 5G standalone in a genuinely cloud native form. And you know, there's been a learning curve amongst the vendors to figure out you know, how, how to actually do that because you know, it's, it's, it's a whole new approach for, for, for most of them. So yeah, certainly the sort of technology gestation uh, ha, has been an issue here. But uh, you know, I, the, the, the operators, as I say, have been consumed with getting new radio out there. And now it's quite widely rolled out. Um, you know, sure, it's time to start rolling out the standalone core, but I, I, I don't see a huge rush. I think it's more important that, that we get it right rather than you know, rush ahead and, and maybe make mistakes. Okay. Uh, now, Maria, the, the, the work you're doing is very much for, involved, I think, on the, on the applications um, side of things. But maybe if you can just tell us a little bit about uh, uh, Weaver Labs and then say if you think that there's any holdup in maybe some of the 5G uh, or some of the applications that 5G promised and whether this has been, uh, has been a little slower in, in coming to market than you thought? Well, I mean, at Weaver Labs, we, we build software that integrates networks. Um, it's at the back of it a, a purely orchestration uh, product, but essentially it, it enables network as a service to any type of infrastructure that can exist in a city. Um, with the, the whole objective to stimulate infrastructure investment uh, to new players and glue all of these networks that initially exist in, in silos. Um, so in terms of 5G readiness, I mean, 
we we had to get uh, like you know our hands dirty and and, and start deploying 5G um, with especially private networks because um, you know if if we want to integrate networks well these networks need to exist and we we have also seen that there is a strong push from the private network market to you know, invest in telecoms infrastructure in areas where um, mobile network operators do not see a commercial benefit to do so, and fill in those gaps with new owners of, of networks. And when it comes to the readiness of, of 5G and, and how it has evolved, well, I, I, I do second what Martin was saying, it's like the, the vendors need to be able to provide those softwares that for us to be able to grab them on deployment, whether you are a mobile network operator or um, a systems integrator. And um, in terms of, of, of the standalone core itself, we are working with it um, and we've integrated it with an open RAN environment. Um, it works, but I believe that for a network that needs to sustain millions of users, maybe it's, it's not there yet. Um, but I'm, I'm confident that the vendors are, you know, slowly getting there so that all these applications in cities are going to be able to leverage uh, the, the, the wide variety of infrastructure that will exist. Okay. Yes. I mean, uh, as, as Martin said, um, it's maybe not as far behind as might have been realistically uh, expected. Uh, and maybe some of this kind of, you know, uh, things have gone too slow have been from some of the parties that wished it was going quicker so that the revenues might be a, a little fatter in 2021 or 2020. But if you think about it, 2017, um, we were deploying the first 5G test network with Ericsson in London, and it's only 2022 that we're actually thinking about where do we place the network functions, where is the edge? You know, we're asking quite advanced questions, and it's only been, what, like five years? So actually technology, I believe has evolved quite fast for the massive change that 5G brings to what 4G was. Yes, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a complete platform change and a, exactly. a different way of working, different way of thinking, as, as we heard a little bit this morning. Uh, Hannon, from a, a Red Hat perspective, uh, what are you seeing in terms of, of how Edge is being used and how many 5G conversations are you having with operators um, uh, right now, and are they talking to you about, about how they are now ready for their standalone core? So, um, we have had many. Uh, but we, one needs to understand that operator have, are right now in, in a kind of a, a crossroad. Um, they are in the shift of putting 5G in life, most of them. Um, and it's, you know, it takes time, and the evolution the natural evolution from 4G to 5G, and this is what most of the telco operators have chosen, is going on the non-standalone mode first. So getting ready, getting ready on the radio side, and we're going to be migrating the core when it's needed. And I think that goes accord with what you guys were saying, say when it's needed. I think it's needed now because we understand that, you know, to have all the capabilities for the 5G, we need that 5G core in place. On the other side, have been in a journey on, from NFB and it's the end, transforming the infrastructure for the past seven years. And now there, there is a, in another step forward. So we have, we have seen what we have been doing with OpenStack on virtualizing all the core infrastructure so far. Uh, now we are seeing uh, Kubernetes taking the, as the platform for what is going to be the new cloud native infrastructure, and especially for the 5G. And we're seeing that on the core, we're seeing that on the radio access network as well with this integration. So there is many things that still have to happen. Uh, there is a lot of work that has been done. We have been working uh, on, with the whole ecosystem. Uh, on one side, on the open source communities. On the other side, with the NEPs. On the other side, with system integrate to make sure that the platforms are ready for this kind of workload. And we have seen that's going to be soon many of those networks out there that's going to be live on a cloud native platform, on a cloud native infrastructure. This is a huge step forward. <coughs> in what we have seen so far. Okay. And uh, Graham, I mean, you've seen a, a lot of uh, evolutions from, from different generations of, of mobile network. Uh, and usually there's a lot of focus on, you know, the, the speed of mobile broadband in the last couple of generations. But now with this, with the 5G standalone core, there's a slightly different focus after the early implementations. How important is it that maybe, you know, the edge deployments are there, the 5G core capabilities are there? So, well, so 
Um, I, I'm coming at this from the point of view of, of private networks exclusively, right? Because the, I should say CKHIOD, which is a terribly named organization. Basically, if you think of us as being three global, we're part of the Hutchison Group. We own lots of mobile operators. We own, we're the second biggest port operator in the world. We own a bunch of utilities and that kind of thing. So, and and uh, Green King Breweries as well. So that's probably the best thing we own. Actually. <laughs> um, and so a lot of my time is taken up uh, servicing uh, our sister companies, the, the ports uh, and the utilities, with their particular industrial application needs. And uh, so we use, we do use a standalone cause in a private network context because it's a lot easier to deploy a standalone core as a, you know, an island of connectivity in a particular place. It's much simpler to do that than to have a, a standalone cloud core in a public network. Um, I would say that, uh, and obviously that in itself is edge computing, right? Because it's some software that runs on some computers or some servers or whatever, on the, usually on the customer's premises, right? So that's an edge computing application right there. But then if you think about um, the applications that our customers want to put over those private networks, they've really changed a lot. So six or seven years ago, we were just a better sort of Wi-Fi, right? So we provided much better coverage, much more reliable coverage in a port or an airport, and it was better than Wi-Fi. Right, uh, and, and so you could use it for operational purposes. But from a telco perspective, it was not that hard to do, actually. I mean, you know, because we know how to design networks, and so you bang up some base stations and you put a 4G core in, and Bob's your uncle, right? That, that's it, right? Now, it's much more difficult because our customers are going, oh, yeah, yeah we, we're buying these autonomous trucks, right? And we, we're going to have like 25 autonomous trucks on a pause. And, and we want to, they need to be connected up to a safety management system and a control system and this and that and the other. And that's hard. That is quite hard when you come from the world of telco, actually. And, and what we really are now is a systems integrator more than, more than a telco. Um, because those applications, those remote control applications or autonomous vehicle applications, they're very, um, they demand extremely low latency. So you've got to have those applications in the customer's premises as well. And then there's a whole bunch of video analytics applications and a lot of that has to be hosted on-prem as well. Uh, and then, you know, predictive maintenance, that a lot of that is hosted on the, on the customer's premises as well. So. Yeah, our world has really changed in the past, I, I would say really in the past sort of two or three years from, from an area where we were just kind of like telco engineers, but in a, you know, working with mini networks in, in very much in our comfort zone to an area where actually we've had to become systems integrators and we've, we've had to use, and we're, we, we're pretty agnostic about how that edge capability is provided. It doesn't have to come from us, it could come from anybody. Uh, as long as we can bolt it all together and, and serve the customer. Okay. Uh, interesting then. And do you feel that that has changed and evolved over the past three years? I mean, is this how you saw it shaping up? No. I, I was saying to Maria, actually, when, 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 just before we came on stage, if we, knew, if we knew seven years ago what we'd be doing now, would we have actually done it? Um, we might have done, but we were kind of, we, we, we came into it because we, you know, Hutchinson's got lots of big mobile networks, right? And so we thought, well, this is just like a mobile network, but smaller. And that's how it was in the beginning. But it isn't like that now. It's totally not like that now. Um, and, and we've had to, you know, reskill, hire completely new kinds of skills into our business because we're not, essentially, we're not really a telco anymore. That's part of what we do, but it's, like 20% of what we do, I would say. Okay. Uh, uh, interesting. Uh, and this might, might play into this kind of uh, reimagining of, of what would have been a telco into a tech co, yeah. I guess, in, in many yeah, ways, exactly. and bringing in more of these uh, uh, digital skills. Um, so th there's, it's clear that there's some very specific um, uh, use cases for, for Edge and some of the standalone 
uh, core capabilities that, that have been um, developed. Um, uh, and it's also clear, I think somebody uh, in one of the sessions earlier on, I think in the, in the cloud session, mentioned Mobile EdgeX as an example of a company that kind of, you know, uh, rode the wave of, of Edge, but uh, didn't, didn't reach its potential. And it's kind of, uh, it still exists, uh, but not, not in the way uh, it thought it was going to be. So uh, have, have telcos rushed into to Edge or some ideas of how edge computing can help them a little bit too, too fast and had to, to rein back? Uh, uh, and are there too many options? Were there too many ideas? Was it all a bit too open? Uh, and at the moment, the, 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 the distributed edge for, uh, for wide area network implementations, is it really just down to, to virtual RAN? Is that the, the, the big opportunity? Now, I'm going to start with Paul here because I know that you've, you know, at, at Wind River, this has been a... Uh, 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 a, a big part of what you've been doing in the past couple of years, and this is in, in many ways a, a, a use case of edge in telco and 5G uh, for this industry. Mm. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about that and, and what you've discovered uh, in that journey with, uh, with Verizon and others, I guess? Yeah, certainly, Ray. So it's really been an interesting thing. What we have going on in the industry right now is a bit of battle with respect to how you deploy the edge. There's the classical appliance-based method, which has been used for decades to build these networks. And there's this new virtualized compute approach using cloud-native principles at the edge of the network. And as that battle goes on, we start talking about things like 5G SA core and why it's not happening, why it's not network slicing. And you also see an overlap with the OT edge, right? You look at things like uh, uh, lights-out manufacturing and, and uh, the energy grid management, drone delivery systems, automobiles and you are start, starting to talk about the actual use cases that drive the emergence of compute at the edge and the use of, of network slicing and 5G standalone core use cases. Um, when you start looking at that, you know, a specific example, right, where you've got vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle accident avoidance, even before you get to autonomous vehicles, just performing accident avoidance, and you have, uh, you know, a vehicle following a truck and it can't see around that truck and you want to take a left turn, you can't make use today of the data that's in the other vehicles that are around it to complete the picture for that system that's geared for accident avoidance. And so what's required there is connectivity between the vehicles in a low latency fashion. And in order to provide this, a piece of that application actually needs to sit at the edge of the network. And this is the key space where new revenue enablers are being provided for service providers. But not only is network slicing needed to protect the QoS of that, of that connection to that edge device and that system, you need compute at the edge too. And so we come back to what you introduced there, the work that we're doing with VRAN, with Verizon in the US, a very highly scaled network in production for some time, the work we're doing with ORAN, uh, with Vodafone in, in the UK here. Uh, these operators have a choice as to how they build their networks. And if you choose it with the, the legacy approach, you're gonna have a difficult time bringing these new revenue enabling applications to the edge of the network and, and making use of 5G standalone core and the, uh, uh, and the network slicing that it can provide control of from core to edge. And so if you look at that, you say, all right, now compute is required at the edge of the network. And that needs to drive your decision as to how you build your 5G network. Enter VRAN and ORAN. And yes, the business case for virtualizing the edge of the network can be solely driven by VRAN or ORAN. And that's a great thing assuming that you can get the TCO to the right levels, and we've now proven that you can do that, you can get the performance to the right levels, the scalability, management, automation, orchestration, et cetera. Uh, that's now proven and, and in the past. And so that gives you the ability to have a business case to justify the build of your 5G network using a fully virtualized cloud native approach. And once you've built that, you now are virtualized, thanks to NFE in the early years being used at the core, now pushing all the way out to the far edge of your network as a fully virtualized architecture, you're now operating a fully a cloudified infrastructure. And wherever you need to deploy that workload, if a piece of it's in the core, a piece of it's in the hyperscaler, a piece of it for low latency, high performance reasons needs to sit at the edge of the network, you can now build those revenue enabling applications that are you know, the, the real nirvana of why 5G has been brought to market. Uh, but you've got to virtualize the edge of the network and support initiatives like ORAN. Otherwise, you won't have that platform at the edge. Okay, so, I mean, that sound, this sounds like, a, you know, uh, a one particular strategic reason has, has kind of driven this particular uh, rollout and deployment. But 
this sounds like it's creating an opportunity on which lots of other new services and applications and, and opportunities can be built. So um, is that the case? And if so, why aren't more operators doing it? Because this isn't where they need to get to quickly. Um, yeah. Edge capabilities, low latency services we hear all the time are going to be deal breakers. Um, why are there so few operators doing it? What, what's, hol what's holding it back? Uh, well, I, I, I think they are kind of slightly in wait and see mode around the use cases. Uh, I mean, I think it, it, if I were an operator and thinking about a big investment in, 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 a, in the sort of edge that supports edge applications, okay, now bear in mind that when, when we talk about edge, there's huge scope for confusion <laughs> because there are lots of different edges, right? Yeah. Uh, there's the telco edge, you know, which is very much the place where the sort of workloads that Paul's been talking about, you know, your ORAN, your, your packet core, um, those things, specific telco network function workloads. Then there's like a, like a public cloud edge where apps are going to run, you know, video analytics and stuff like that. Um, and then there's private edge. And, you know, to, to, to Graham's point, actually 5G standalone is rolling out. It's just in the form of private 5G networks rather than, than, than public 5G networks. If I were an operator, I'd be looking at the evolution of the private 5G market to identify the use cases that represent potentially low-hanging fruit for slices in the public 5G domain. Um, and it's still very early days, that, that, that market. And I think, you know, the, 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 you, know you, you can speculate about, you know, vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication and stuff like that. I mean, these are very, very challenging applications, not just from a technology standpoint, but like, how do all the relationships between the different partners work? You know, how's the public safety thing work? How does, the, how does regulation work? I mean, th there are a ton of, of challenging issues around those apps, and I'm absolutely not saying they're not gonna happen. Um, it, 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 but to, to, to imagine that it's gonna happen quickly, I think, is uh, is, is Yeah, I mean, if, if, I, if I could just add to what Martin just said, I would totally agree with you, right? Uh, that that we, we've been pitched uh, 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 lots of well, not lots, but a few anyway, quite interesting ideas, especially around cars and <coughs> traffic management and LIDAR and all sorts of stuff about, you know, and making it, making it basically safer to drive on the highway and so because you can kind of see around corners and all of that kind of stuff, right? And, and it's, it's incredibly cool, but there are so many questions about, well, we, you know, what, do we do this on our own? Like, do, do we three UK or three Sweden, do we do this on our own? Like, who's gonna pay us? And, and, and where is the money coming from for this? And, and I, as you were talking there, Paul, I was just thinking well, that's a kind of, it's almost like a public good, that, that service that you were describing. It's, it's kind of good for everybody, right? And, and makes me wonder whether, you know, whether any individual telecom operator really would be carrying that. I mean, maybe BT in this country would do that, but, but, but certainly three wouldn't. Um, and, you know, it, there's an argument for saying maybe that's something that should be centrally funded and centrally resourced. I can add to that. Yeah, absolutely. A, a tougher proposition just right now as well for the central uh, funding of this kind yeah, of thing. Well, Again, yeah, depending on where you want to put your yeah. money, do you want to put it in railways or the digital highway? Yeah. yeah. We are actually working on a transport um, application with a private 5G network, which is funded by public sector. Um, because I agree, it, <coughs> it is, you know, it, it is a transport authority who would want to improve a productivity in the city, safety in the roads. So, of course, they, they would want to invest in a network so that they can put products and services on top and, and get the, you know, the commercial output that they would want as a public sector um, authority, right? Um, our commercial output, it's improved productivity in the city because we can monetize that. Um, so, and, and that is what we're seeing, um, that, that it's happening more and more throughout these specialized use cases. The investment is diversifying. And we are doing a lot of innovation in network deployments and playing around with, uh, you know, edge deployments or where do we place the, the core, where do we place the virtual network functions, creating capabilities for um, applications to run in the edge. Um, but until, 
mobile network operators come and do this in a, in a mass um, scalable deployment, it is difficult because they don't have the capital justification for that. Whereas a transport authority, it's a no-brainer. So right now, in our results in, in the network that we're building in South Ford, to connect one site, so one sensor to the network, um, it costs you 45,000 pounds, right? Because you're building a 5G network to connect one sensor. If you connect eight, then it costs you the same as, as wiring one sensor with Ethernet, 6,000 pounds. So, and, and with a 5G cellular network, you can connect more than eight, <laughs> <laughs> fairly more than that. Even running, a, you know, we run everything in the edge, right? So compute is very, very lean, but you can get more than 50 devices connected there, right? So it justifies the investment for them, but maybe not for a large mobile network operator. Right. And, and, and to Martin's point there, where he, you know, he was saying, you know, maybe the, 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 the use cases uh, and the application ideas of what could be uh, resonate with, with, with end users might come just from finding out what works in private networks. Uh, do you, is that something that, that makes sense to you as well? Because it sounds like you're doing a lot of, you know, hot development in, 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 in small instances. Absolutely. So uh, before we founded Weaver Labs, we were working at, at King's College London in, in Innovation Lab. And I remember working with British telecoms and asking us the question of like, why should I invest in an ultra reliable low latency network? What are the use cases and what is our return on investment? So sounds we're still asking that question for those very expensive networks. And because network slicing, sadly, is still not here and we can't just, you know, slice the network and, and test it out, we need to go and, and create private networks. So we will see the benefits from that and, and, and hopefully mobile network operators would tag along and, 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 and reap the benefits from, from those. Right. So, uh, you know, they, there's a, a lot of activity, a lot of innovation going on in, in, in private networks, and we're just starting to hear some of the real-world use cases. I think uh, uh, Oliver from Verizon mentioned this morning the, the, the port of Southampton here in the UK. I heard the, the head of IT there talking uh, the other week, and um, you know there, there was an original use case, and now about three or four others have come on top of that. You know, the, the safety uh, element of it is something they didn't build for, but which has come out from the deployment. But these things are happening uh, like a, in, in an island, and you can, you can learn from it, but you maybe can't you know, use it and connect to it. So we've got a question in here, and I want to, to bring, uh, uh, to, to put this one, um, it's a continuation of this theme to you, Hannan. And the question is, uh, this has come from one of our uh, online viewers, uh, what are the processes that operators are adopting to be able to deploy repeatable and reusable solutions uh, at the edge um, that can be efficiently optimized for different uh, use cases? So in, in the big, broader networks, I mean, nobody wants to deploy we don't want to go down the silo approach, obviously, here. We, we want to, to be able to build platforms that are multi-use. How can that be done effectively? Because you don't want to go two steps forward and one step back, do you? And, and, and that goes along with your, your original question, is, 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 is it virtual RAN or open RAN, right? Uh, the past or, or how we're seeing it. And in fact, it, uh, open RAN and VRAN are the great opportunity for the telcos to build edge strategy. And this is what we're seeing. We're seeing that this is an opportunity. And it's, when I'm talking about the edge, I will say I will talk about the telco edge. I'm not going to go into the enterprise edge yet. <laughs> I can later on. Um, and, and this is important because, and I think there was this morning, uh, some of the panelists that was mentioning it, they say, it's not about the mobile only, right? It's, as, it's because the, and when we're talking major, me, edge on the telco ecosystem, we're talking about Mac. Right, the multi-access, and this is what is important. Part they say it's not about having the radio access; it's as well to have the fixed access because we're going to need, and they're going to need to fulfill many use cases out there. These are large spectrum of use cases, and this is where the difficulty is. They don't know what what need to be targeted at first. You were mentioning one of those. This is only one of them. You were mentioning the mining. Uh, there is plenty of there, many scenarios out there that they need to cover with the same infrastructure. Now. That's the difficulty part, is how to build the flexibility and the agility on that infrastructure. 
And this is what we have been working with many operators out there to help now in defining how that infrastructure look like, not only for the radio access network, for the fixed access network as well. So they can have a common platform. They can have a common platform to host network functions <coughs> for the fix, for the radio, for the core, because there are components of the core that we cannot underestimate. We, we have, if we want to achieve that low latency on that 5G core, we need to distribute the, the user plane. Okay, where we're going to distribute this user plane on the same telco edge that we need on the same infrastructure. Now we're looking at an infrastructure with multiple requirements from different type of access and the core. Um, so there is, and one of the things that we have seen is that there is a platform that is there, a cloud native platform that is there that can allow them to build that infrastructure with the flexibility and the agility that they need. Now the infrastructure is not alone. You were mentioning about the processes. So there is where we're talking about automation. Say, we cannot be building network as we built it 150 years ago. We need to build networks as we need for tomorrow, not even for today, for tomorrow, when we don't know even what the use case will be, what the killer application that we're waiting for <laughs> is. We don't know yet, right? Um, so, and automation is critical on that path. Say, there is, there is we need to define and create that footprint or that blueprint that we can repeat at scale. And this is not only talking about telco infrastructure that is owned by the telco, that is hosted on the telco, because there will be some use cases where that infrastructure will be hosted in somewhere else house, which we want to be seen. So the point is, there is even more opportunities out there for the telcos as well, for building us not only the infrastructure, but building the network that's going to interconnect all those make locations independently that is their own or somebody else make, because that will be a reality as well. There will be, and you are seeing now, there will be providers out there proposing their make platforms out there. Host your make application is there. Now there is another thing that we haven't talked about, is because we always talk about what the telco is doing, what the telco needs to be doing, and we talk about the, the ecosystem, but there is another stakeholder in that. It's the developers of top make application, where they are. And are they involved in the conversation so far? And this is only, only one part of it. Then when we start peeling that edge <laughs> onion, and you will see many layers out there, um, there is the whole ecosystem. So yeah, we're gonna have the NEPs helping out on building our infrastructure, bringing their CNF and cloud native CNF. There will be system integrators out there. And system integrators are gonna play a critical role. Why? Because now, Operators need to start looking at is I want to be not only, I'm not looking right now into the commercial, the consumer side of 5G, I'm looking at the enterprise side of 5G, right? And I'm looking into many verticals. Do I have the experience? Do I have the skills? Do I have the capability to address all those vertical needs? There was a panelist this morning, I don't remember, um, I think it was from Colt that was mentioning, say they had the opportunity because they built that opportunity, they build those skills so they can address financial, right? Well, there will be a verticalization in the telco that they're not gonna be only to worry about the network itself, they will have to worry about all those verticals and how they're gonna be able to scale. One thing is handling a network that has 10,000, 100,000 locations, okay? Another thing is handling 10,000 networks because you decide to put private 5G, a complete private 5G core and radio in a customer side. This, we are in another dimension. So we need to have this scale. They need to build for that scale. They need to build the process. They need to build the flexibility on the infrastructure and the agility because it's something that is not gonna stay there for two days. It's gonna stay there for five years, but during those five years, during that life cycle, there will be evolution because those companies, and this is one of the role of the operators and the opportunity for the operators as well, is to be the enabler for helping those enterprise, you know, during their digital transformation. So there is a lot of opportunities, but there is a lot of challenges, and how they're gonna address them, that is, that is where the mix, and, and they will have to find a way through all that, you know, jungle, I would say, that is the industry out there mm -hmm. for, 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 for the enterprise make. And, and, and that's the billion or trillion dollar question, whichever uh, analyst house you, 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 you might uh, look to for statistics. But uh, uh, there's a lot of tick boxes there. Um, and uh, we, we've got a question uh, before we move on to the next sort of uh, 
uh, planned and prepped talking point. We've got a question, uh, another question coming from the online audience. But before we get to that one, I just want to check and see if there's uh, uh, if there are any uh, comments or questions from the audience. Yes, Francis there in the middle um, um, so that we can get some, some views or thoughts on the floor. Yeah, in terms of um, actually getting the opportunity from the edge, I think one of the, the challenges, I, I, I think, is that we, we, we think edge is a distinct concept of telco. Um, telcos previously have thought about owning the edge, but at the end of the day, all edge is, is compute and storage at a particular, at a particular location. It isn't inherently bound to communications. Um, it, has it has other choices, which are put something at the site, put something in a private network, which is effectively a, a data center in, within the community. We'll, um, I'm just considering whether the panel feel it would help us if we just actually sort about edge less from a telco perspective, but from a perspective of, of the consumer of it, which is basically, do I get a more efficient computing? Do I get better operational cost or some other, some other aspect of it? Rather than talking about edge as a very distinct telco thing. Uh, well, I'll pick that up first. I mean, I, I sort of agree with you, I think. I, I, I think Edge is a really kind of confusing... I, I don't know who started talking about this, but it's a really kind of con confusing thing. I'm easily confused, I admit, but, but it is confusing, right? Because it's just some computers, right, in a particular place, like on the customer's premises or, or in, a, in, a, in a data centre close to some base stations or some antennas or whatever, right? So <coughs> that's, that's essentially what we're talking about. So computers on the customer premises, that's, that's revolutionary, mm. isn't it? Like, we were doing that like 70 years ago, and now we're doing it again. Um, and uh, just w w with my kind of simpleton hat on, I get quite confused by the whole edge terminology. I can, you know, when, when I look at what my customers need to do, it's really obvious that some of them will need servers on their premises, right, because of the applications that they're running. And, in, and that's, that is expensive, okay, but hey, that's, you know, that's, that, there's a business case of what they're trying to do, so that's fine, right? And, and in other cases, they don't need that. And, <clears throat> the challenge, I suppose the challenge for us in the private networks world is just kind of segueing back to what Hannon was just saying is, is, to, is to scale that up. Like we've built Frankenstein's monster on the table with the levers and the electrodes and everything and it's just sat up on the bed, you know, and now I've got a, a robot or an autonomous vehicle. And, there, and there's suddenly only like a thousand of them for £10 each. You know, in, <laughs> in five different countries, and uh, oh, like, okay, that's quite hard. You know, that's the, and, and the, that's quite difficult. But I do think that, yeah, edge is just a really, really. It does, can I? Can, can, it, can it's I, a confusing term, I think. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, if, if I can venture a, a, a thought from you know how it, you know where did edge come from? It actually came out of the standards bodies, largely. Um, and, um, well, let me, let me ask this question then, and you can continue, because the okay. question that's come in, and I guess this is maybe because uh, some, some of the standards, uh, industry bodies and standards bodies have been working on edge you know, specifications for years. The question is, what contributions, if any, can standards development organizations make to help shape the paths forward for 5G and edge? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll come to that in, 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 in just a moment. But it, thinking back to the very early days of this, what was going on was, uh, you know, 5G um, was developed with the idea of supporting a whole bunch of interesting new network capabilities, including low latency. And in order to, uh, you know, make the case for that, um, you know, people dreamed up all sorts of use cases that require low latency. And then it was, you know, and, and the, I mean, the telco seized on this because, you know, they're struggling with the growth of hyperscalers and the public cloud and all that stuff going on. And the, the rhetoric at the time was, there is this whole new class of applications that needs low latency and therefore physically has to be close to the access networks. And whoopee, the hyperscalers don't have any real estate in that area, but we do. We, the telcos, have got real estate because we've got central offices, we've got places where we run packet core. So there's a whole new opportunity here now uh, to support a class of applications that the hyperscalers can't support because they're too centralized. Um, so I think, you know, the, the, to me, there was a little bit of wishful thinking around, around some of that. And I think if you, if you look at what's actually happened, 
First of all, uh, a lot of the use cases are actually not that sensitive to latency. Uh, I mean, in the private 5G space, we see a lot of people using this for video analytics, where you know, you're looking for safety infringements or you're doing a QA inspection or something like that. Well, you don't have to, I mean, you don't have to get the answer back in less than a millisecond, right? 15, 20 milliseconds is absolutely fine. Even 100 milliseconds, frankly. Um, so, you know, latency is sometimes, I think, oh, it overstated the importance of it. The other thing that's worth remembering is that um, in some parts of the world, it's true that hyperscale cloud is a very long way from maybe thousands of miles away from populations it serves. But in a lot of other parts of the world, that's not the case. And you know, if you look at measured latencies in the UK between you know, any, anywhere in the UK you care to name and where Azure has its uh, Azure regions in, in London and Cardiff, it's of the order of 10 or 15 milliseconds. Right? And actually it could be improved because the, the routing is quite inefficient. There's a lot of router hops which are, add to latency. So actually an awful lot of edge applications could perfectly well be supported out of uh, you know, centralized uh, d data centers. And you know, a lot of European telcos are saying, you know, we don't need to build our edge because we're small enough and compact enough as a country that the whole country is the edge. If you like. <laughs> um, so does this so, come back a little bit to, to Francis's point that, that maybe this is being uh, overthought and just think, you know, with what is already there, which is already possible, maybe in some of the, uh, say, on continental Europe, do we even need to be like, you know, well, taking this any in, in, in order for this edge proposed by the standards bodies to be useful, there has to be a class of applications that needs quite a bit of bandwidth, needs very low latency, it needs to be very widely distributed. And I don't think we've, we've come up with it yet. Now, the metaverse might be it because well, okay, it might, I said. You win a uh, prize, by the way, Martin. But, but the first to, person uh, to mention it. Yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> After lunch, incredible. Um, but, but I think a lot of the other use cases, I mean, there, there are some very high value use cases, I mean, associated with you know, like transport, you know, motorway networks and, and that kind of thing. But it's very hard to think of consumer applications other than mixed reality. So I'll use mixed reality in, as, as a term instead of metaverse. Um, that really demand that very specific combination of bandwidth, latency, and compute power, where you know this concept of edge proposed by Etsy and, and 3GPP really makes sense. Okay. I guess I'd, I'd have a. Oh, go please go ahead. It's just a point on the. I mean, we, we build networks, right? We 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 engineer ways of connecting things, and. We've always, since, since the beginning of 5G, we started thinking about what is going to be the application that justifies this or that network design. Uh, whereas if we go back to, you know, what maybe the edge deployment makes sense from a network design perspective, right? Like, I want it to be cost effective. I don't want to spend that much money on very expensive data centers. I just want to have you know, lean software, low compute, and very distributed, and scale the network by adding more edge nodes rather than, um, you know, buying very expensive servers that can host, um, you know, a, a large open stack platform, and so on and so forth. Um, so, in, in, in some private networks that we have been working on, that was exactly the, the design choice was edge, just because it, it served the, the, the requirements of, of the network design that we were building, not an application itself. It was just like, the network needs to be easy to maintain, it needs to be cheap, easy to scale, it cannot go in very expensive servers, it has to run in, in very you know, cheap computers. So that was a no-brainer for us to, 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 to use edge deployment. But very much to what uh, it was said before, Edge is just another place where we just run software. So we don't leverage, you know, all the Etsy standards because it's just, it's, it's the same. I think that we take a very different perspective on this problem at my company. We're, we have kind of the luxury of being involved not only in the, we call this Edge, near Edge, far Edge, and device Edge, right? Because it, it is a problem with this terminology, right? Just Edge. And at the far edge where you're sitting at the extreme edge of a carrier network, say at the base station of a cellular tower, that's very different than in the device edge, the OT domain, 
where you're in safety critical real-time systems. You're in an aircraft, you're in an automobile, you're in a drone that is, is flying over people's heads. And this is a place where milliseconds is hilarious. Microseconds are what matter. And extreme real-time performance is critical to save human lives. And in those software-based systems, safety certified systems, over the past 10 years, these things have become hyper-connected now. And many of these use cases that we're starting to talk about are about the service provider being able to provide connectivity between these hyper-connected real-time edge systems. There's no doubt in my mind, if we go five to 10 years from now, in the same way that five to seven years ago, we would have laughed or, or really looked at an autonomous vehicle as being a nearly impossible thing. We saw the, the vans loaded with computers and cameras spinning in LiDAR, you know, trying to work their way through a parking lot, right? And now, hey, maybe I'll go buy a Tesla, right? It's, it's a different world. And I believe that these, these real-time safety critical systems where human lives are involved, automobiles, great example we've been talking about here today, these are going to actually happen. And these ultra low latency requirements are going to become very, very real when human lives are involved. And so I think you have to think about the device edge and the end use application. We, we have talked throughout today about there needs to be a real application that drives the interest to use these capabilities and network, completely agree. But I do believe they're coming, right? And, and you have to build the network out in the right way so that you enable these capabilities when those microseconds matter. Okay. Um, so in the uh, interest of time, because we've got more questions coming in, we've got more talking points, we've got some external contributions, I think we'll, we'll move on. And thank you to Francis. Uh, we'll come back to the audience in a few minutes as well, again, and see if there's any more questions from there. Uh, but let's move on now and, and delve a little bit more into uh, enterprise services, what enterprises really want and the, and the private 5G space. And uh, you know, there, there, there are great aspirations, I think we know from, in fact, we heard some of it this morning, from service providers who, who see a real opportunity to, you know, to find those new revenue streams from private wireless network uh, deployments uh, that are, at the moment are for uh, mostly large uh, deployments like uh, uh, ports and, and airports and, and so on and so forth. Um, now, if telcos really believe they can be competitive here, because there's an awful lot of companies chasing this, this, this business, um, uh, if they can be competitive here, leveraging their own uh, edge assets and their own IT platforms, then you know, what is the plan here? How are they going to do it? And is there a particular blueprint for success? Uh, so to, to get us into this conversation, uh, Mirko Voltolini uh, from Colt uh, is, is our external, our, our guest speaker who's not with us today, but part of this conversation. Uh, so let's hear uh, from, from Mirko on this topic. Is there a blueprint uh, for what telco should do with private 5G and enterprise edge? It is definitely a very complex uh, environment that we are developing. Uh, vertical uh, focus use cases huh? within that uh, defining blueprints uh, of the different components but you cannot take the blueprint and then apply to a let's say a smart office environment in that case the type of applications will change uh, uh, i think the ingredients are typically common but they change in terms of uh, how you pick them and how you put them together so i think you know Merck and i chatted a, a, a little bit more uh, and I think it's this case of what he was talking about here is that there, there are some things that are the, the same for different companies, different verticals, but actually there's a hell of a lot that, that's different. And you can't just say, okay, we've, we've, we've done a job over there. We've done a job at a port and now we can just take that model and, and put it over there at a, at a shopping center or, or somewhere else. Um, so uh, is, there a, is there a blueprint? Is there a set of, uh, of ideals for telcos to, to be able to go and win the business away from, you know, let's face it, from some of the vendors? Uh, uh, Nokia has been incredibly successful uh, with its uh, private networks business. Other vendors are chasing this. System, systems integrators are chasing this. Hyperscalers probably in there as well. So how can telcos grab a bit of this action? Um, anybody want to um, Yeah, well, I start I'll kick it off. Right, yeah. so... Uh, it's a really good question, and, and I would say, coming from a telco background, that we don't really bring any secret sauce to this at all, actually. Um, so <laughs> we did, as I said before, we did, we did like six or seven years ago because we really understood 
how to build mobile networks. And all that was required was a little mobile network and bish bash brosh. You know, that was it, job done. <coughs> now it's really different. And um, I think that the, our view is that uh, for us, we have, we've got a track record in implementing networks in difficult environments in critical national infrastructure. Um, often with a degree incorporating things like vehicle automation and, and or remote control vehicles or whatever. But that critical national infrastructure and the difficult environment stuff is really important because when you, when you come to think about the service that you will offer to the customer, the customer, you know, the customer sitting there going, this is absolutely mission critical to my operation. I want it available five nines, okay. And you go, okay, well then how, how are we going to store spares, right? And an airport, right? And, and how are we gonna know that those spares are the, in the place where we left them, right? Because, <laughs> Because what you don't want is somebody turning up and going to the room, you know, and then the bloody thing is all there, right? So, so <coughs> you have to think now to a really, really granular level of detail. How do we get people airside, right? At what security clearances do they, those people need to have? When we connect up uh, a base station with the core on the customer's site, we're often using fiber that belongs to the customer, which is part of the customer's own IT environment, it's part of their local area network, right? So what happens if the customer, you know, decides that he's gonna change his firewall configurations and then takes down his own private network, right? So, so thinking about all of that in, in, in just painstakingly tedious detail, right? Where, where you just sit in meetings and you bore yourself to death thinking of every conceivable thing that could go wrong, right? Because, and, and that's where we do really well, right? And, and, and so those networks are, well, because we're quite boring people, <laughs> uh, 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 you know, and we bore, the US we bore the customer into submission, you know, and they have to leave the room. <laughs> and, it's, it's a different ball game when you're thinking about six like micro base stations in a warehouse. Yeah, it's totally different, right? And it's much simpler to deploy. And I don't think we've got any particular advantage in that space, right? A lot of other companies could do it as well as we could and for half the price. So just don't go there, right? We're thinking about you know, we, we came at this initially with a mindset of we keep public networks running. And, and when you have to keep public networks running, you have to think about all sorts of scenarios of things that could go wrong. And then we, we applied that and learned an awful lot about airports and ports and big manufacturing plants and so on. They're all different, but, but you can ask the same kind of sets of questions. I mean, just to give you another, again, incredibly tedious example, right? So, so we have a port in Stockholm where we have these autonomous vehicles that they're called straddle carriers and they lift up containers and they stack them. They, they lift them up from the quay and they take them and stack them up and then they'll put them on the back of a truck to leave the port. <coughs> and, <they're, clears throat> and, um, and you might think that if you lost connectivity to a straddle carrier for let's say two seconds, right? When the connectivity comes back, that machine is just going to carry on doing what it was doing, right? But oh no, that's not how it works, right? If you lose connectivity to the straddle carrier, the straddle carrier loses connectivity to the safety management system, and then it, it basically kind of, you know, says, right, okay, I'm no longer safe to operate. So even when the connectivity comes back, it's sitting there going, no, I'm not safe to operate. So it won't move. It will not move under its own steam at all. So, so a human being has to go to that vehicle and take it out of operation to a special area where it then runs through a whole bunch of spin-up tests and then it goes back out into operation. So in order for the human being to get to the straddle carrier, you have to stop all the other straddle carriers, right? So the whole port stops. So if you lose connectivity to that one vehicle for a second or two seconds, the entire port stops working, right? And, and it's understanding that operational environment and going, okay, so first of all, we're gonna design 
redundancy up the wazoo for this network, right? Because we absolutely do not want to lose connectivity to one of these things. And then we need to know if, if the worst happens and something really does go wrong, you know, we need to be super aware of, of what that customer is going through and, and work with them, understand their process and work with them to get them back again. So that's the very long answer to a very simple question, but yeah, <laughs> com complex networks, there you go, complex environments. So is the, is the blueprint for success knowing more about what could go wrong than anybody else. Yeah, it's just dreaming up like nightmare scenario. <laughs> everyone, everyone will go, that will never happen. And you go, well, it might do. It might do. You know? Sounds like you're going, to go into, you're going to go into every meeting and go, you don't want to do this. This is not anything you want to do. Well, the, the question's bigger than that. It's, it, it's all about the application. And you know, Graham's drilled down into the specifics of one particular application. There are all sorts of other applications of 5G that we've seen, you know, retail footfall analysis and uh, you know, safety monitoring in, in, in hazardous areas. You know, every single application has got its own particular characteristics and its own particular set of requirements. And the network, the only things that are common are the, the physical connectivity and the, you know, the back end s systems. And you know, we, we provide a platform, the 5G standalone core, um, uh, you know, a whole bunch of building blocks that you can run at the edge or in the core cloud uh, around video analytics, around, you know, machine learning, uh, <clears throat> you know, e e event ingestion and, and analysis, all that stuff. But we don't really know anything about these applications. It's got to be up to a system integrator who knows that particular vertical, who puts this stuff together. And, you know, all we provide are the, are the, are the building blocks. Now, having said that, we do know some operators who are skilling up to do just that kind of thing, maybe in some specific verticals, and we're only too happy to, to, to work with them. So, you know, we treat operators as another class of system integrator that can bring this kind of solution to market. We just provide the, the bricks that enable these solutions to be built. Yeah, uh, we're, we're exactly. We're, we're a class of systems integrator, and we're focused on, you know, we're on certain verticals and certain kinds of complex networks in critical national infrastructure, because that's, you know, that, that chimes a lot with what we do in our own, running our own networks, I guess. You know, one of the things that we see in this space, in particular private 5G, but also in the macro network is, as a software vendor providing, you know, assets that are used to build these systems, is management of the entire life cycle of the problem. This is a piece of the blueprint. It's not, you know, the entire solution, because obviously the service provider has a tremendous challenge bringing a full deployment of private 5G to an enterprise. But well, we think of uh, you know, develop, deploy, operate, and service, right, at these four quadrants of lifecycle management. And on the develop side, you have you know, the need to build these applications that are actually running in these you know, examples where you need DevSecOps tool chains and the ability to simulate and create virtual twin, twins and try to have an environment in which you can minimize the experience of those type of operational concerns. And then as you go to deploy and operate, this is the real sensitive area, and this is an area where if you can save a dollar in operations, if you can save risk in operations, you know, to that example use case, incredibly valuable. And tools like high levels of software automation, zero touch deployment, single pane of glass management, um, you know, orchestration and automation, software automation of these environments is incredibly important. AI machine learning and analytics and collecting data, right? And this is a solution that's spread across public cloud, private cloud, far edge into the device itself where you're building software applications that span that entire converged software environment. And so if you, if you want to have success in these types of applications, you won't have it without over-the-air updates and management capabilities and operational tools that allow you to deploy and manage and run these environments. Otherwise, the risk is far too high, right? And people won't move to the technology. Yeah, but one thing that operators need to understand is that is they're gonna be into enterprise make and private 5G and they want to be successful on that, they need to understand that they're gonna need an ecosystem, a large ecosystem, is they cannot be building one make platform for everybody. Mm. They cannot be building one private 5G solution for everybody because every vertical we have is own requirements and they need to understand that it's the vertical and the end customer who is posing and providing the requirement, not them. So this is quite different from building their own network when they define what the requirements are for the network. Here is we're in a completely different situation. These enterprises want to have a specific requirements and they are the one driving those requirements. So the operator needs to have an ecosystem of different solutions 
that's ready to address the different verticals. And this is something that is going to, they, they will have to build as a capability as well. How do I absorb technology? And how fast I can absorb technology to move for a specific vertical on one day, another vertical the day after? And this is where, and one of the things that we have been working on is providing that kind of platform, the flexibility on the platform that's not only going to build the connectivity, because private 5G is about connectivity. And the last thing that the customer needs, the end customer needs, is connectivity. The customer needs to run a business. And the business is not running a private 5G network. The business is to run the port, is, is to run the mine. That's their business. And these applications that are going to be running next to that connectivity, that is where we are talking about enterprise make. And this is where operators need to understand that this is what they need to be providing as a value. What platform that they can provide, what infrastructure they can provide, what the ecosystem they need to build to be successful on this. System integrators are going to play a critical role in that because they understand specifically the needs of every single vertical out there. And it's not going to be only one system integrator that we're going to need. They're going to need a system integrator basically for every vertical out there. And even in different regions, they're going to need a different system integrator as well. So they have to build an ecosystem. And this is something that we have been doing together, putting that ecosystem in place, making sure that all this application runs, making sure that we have as well a developer program in place so that because somebody needs to build those edge applications, so those make applications, they need to run and need, somebody needs to build. So we need to have that as well as part of it something that is not going to come out of the sky. There is, of course, system integrators have been doing that job for a long time, but there will be opportunities as well for the developer community out there to bring applications, not only on the, on the B2B, that is the model we have been discussing so far. I am, an I am a telco and selling to an enterprise. There will be a scenario where we're a B2B to C, where there will be customers at that infrastructure that is that built on the airport that will be used not only by enterprise, it will be used as well by consumers. And what applications are those, and how open is that infrastructure to be able to host all those applications? So, uh, does this mean then that maybe the you know the telco community might have to uh, get to the point where, because the collaboration with whether it's systems integrators or any other kind of company that really understands better than them. The, the, the vertical industries that they're trying to appeal to, that the telcos might have to be the partner rather than the lead. Is this the, the scenario we're looking at? I think they're, they can still lead because there are a lot of valuable inputs that, that the telcos are going to bring to the table. It's just understanding that there's a suite of uh, building blocks, as, as Martin was, was using this word. Like it is, we, we can use them and they, they should be open to, to use them. Uh, to construct this, these networks that, that satisfy the enterprise. And one thing that I want just to, 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 to bring to the table is also the, the large amount of innovation that the startup ecosystem is, is bringing to, to the enterprise ecosystem. And there is, you know, all this talk about XR apps or the developer ecosystem in, in, the, in mobile edge computing. Uh, those are solutions that tackle very specific problems that can be addressed to one vertical or, or many verticals at the same time. Uh, so opening up that ecosystem, not only through software platforms that can easily onboard software solutions, but also through partnerships and working together, can definitely you know, break this model of one network, one customer, to you know, let's build something that minimizes customization and you know it's replicable because you can do that with software software enables us to be to replicate solutions very easily by just you know bringing um, pieces of the puzzle that are different together so at least in the UK from what we see and also in the US there's so much innovation coming from startups in the telco ecosystem not only on the application layer but within the telco ecosystem. And we will see much more of that coming with XR apps in the future. So I, I think moving towards software platforms and telcos can still you know, keep that leadership role because they own the trust, they have the, 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 you know, the, the expertise of, of knowing exactly what will go wrong and, and, and the customer base. Okay. Um. 
so any any thoughts from the audience here is is this right can the telco be the lead is there a blueprint uh, beyond you know uh, knowing uh, all the different things that could go wrong in a critical network uh, and uh, and and understanding a vertical if there aren't any uh, points or questions from the audience so uh, we can so i'm sorry i beg your pardon yeah we, we've got one at the back there if you can uh, say who you are where you're from Hey, it's uh, Jeff from Rakuten. I'm very interested, sometimes in telecom discussions, I feel we, we always speak about great potential about 18 months to 24 months out, but somehow that never turns up. I, I'm very interested to, to listen to success stories that exist today from the panel. What have we done well in telecom? What have we delivered? What could we repeat in this uh, edge 5G enterprise space? Okay, so we're looking for success existing stories. success stories. Yeah, we don't have any of those. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, we do. Wait, wait. No, 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 no. Uh, so, well, I mean, I suppose we're quite fortunate amongst telcos because we are part of a big industrial conglomerate, Hutchison. So we've got a lot of other businesses in, in our family and we have the opportunity slash we are forced to deliver things uh, to, to those organisations. <laughs> and we've, we've run um, at the Port of Felixstowe, which is uh, the largest container port in the UK, so it accounts for about 45% of our containerized imports. We've run a private 4G network there for seven years, which has been extremely successful. We've just finished, we are, well, we're almost finishing a, a, a 5G SA proof of concept there with use cases including remote control vehicles and um, uh, um, predictive maintenance. And then we'll be going into a production of 5G network next year at that pause. Um, in Stockholm, as I mentioned before, you know, the nightmare scenario of the autonomous vehicles. So we, we actually do that, we've delivered that, um, and they actually do go around all on their own. And when you see it, it's pretty cool. Um, and uh, you know, and then there's a pipeline of other port automation projects that we're that, that we have in, uh, to, to deliver for our sister company, and then increasingly for, for other companies outside, other port operators outside Hutchison. So, um, so uh, you know, we're still at the beginning, but um, that those projects have been successful for the customer, profitable for us, um, and you know, I hope I hope we we can build on that and. You know, have lots more. So, I, I wouldn't say that we've got. You know, it's not a massive business, but um, but it's a good start. Success stories. I can certainly talk to you know, both UK and, and US. There, uh, we've had the uh, incredible fortune of working with a tremendous partner, Verizon, a wonderful customer that we've been working with for several years here, in the process of deploying a highly scaled five uh, G VRAN network. Um, that has been quite a journey. I mean, I have to climb out behind my battle scars to tell <laughs> everything. It's, it's, it's certainly not a perfect uh, experience, but now it's gotten to the point where it's running it uh, in excess of five nines. It's proven the commercial case, the TCO case, around the, the optimized uh, solution that VRAN and ORAN represents for us. Um, and it's running and scaling now out across, across the nation. So, um, you know, you, you had a, a customer there, Verizon, that has a, a really aggressive view and an early adopter view of this technology and it's really been fortunate to work with them to t kind of drive that technology forward. They've been very much a visionary in, in building out that network. We see the same things here in the UK with Vodafone, right? It's with some of the work that we're doing there uh, around ORAN, that first deployment that started uh, using some of our key partners there, Intel and Samsung at that activity and, and Dell as well. Um, so really great working work happening here in the UK as well uh, in, in deploying that. So some great success stories came with a lot of work, right? Came with a lot of uh, challenges that we went through that. I think as uh, Neil mentioned in a previous session, there's complexities to the disaggregation, there's complexities to breaking apart with ORAN, you know, the east-west connections that are happening between the network functions that are in the network. It's gonna take some time to work this through and build the operational you know, tools and capabilities and expertise. Uh, and I would say just on that, I think we spoke recently about the expertise problem. Uh, that's a big piece of this. I think that without the people that we have, 
that have been, you know, boots on the ground working hard with the carrier to develop those knowledge and skills, this wouldn't happen, right? So it's, there's a strong emphasis on the skills of the people that are part of putting this whole thing together. Okay. Great, thanks. So uh, a couple of examples there. I'm, I'm sure there will be more and... Uh, and I know we did hear one this morning, and it's, it's, it's easy for somebody to come along and say, yes, we've had a great success story without the, 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 the person actually using the network or the service being there. But uh, as I mentioned earlier, having heard and spoken to the, the IT director from the port of Southampton here in the UK, he couldn't actually believe how much it had helped their operations and that the, 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 the gains from that particular private wireless uh, deployment were actually far exceeding their expectations. So that's very large deployment, but that's actually a, a sort of you know quite good news and, uh, and encouraging probably for a lot of the operators. Um, so we're we're coming close to the end of time, um, and we do want to to keep on track uh, as for our online audience as well. So we're going to just uh, get into one more uh, talking point very quickly, and it's it's something that uh, cropped up earlier. So we'll go for some uh, some some quick takes. Uh, uh, on, on this, uh, and this is uh, about the um, uh, the way that network operators uh, need to maybe they need to be more savvy uh, about how they are using and sharing uh, the the real estate that they have as their the networks become more distributed and the edge service opportunities grow. Now, there, there was a time when a company like BT was described as a real estate company that provides communication services. Uh, but those, kind of, th those days are shifted, uh, and actually quite a lot of the operators, particularly in Europe, are closing down or selling uh, their, their local exchanges or, or central offices, and so, uh, so um, shrinking their real estate. So is that the, the right thing to be doing? Is there more to be done, you know, in terms of having the edge? It is only compute in a location, but if it's going to be useful, is there something more interesting or more savvy that can be done with these kind of uh, uh, capabilities and resources? Does anybody want to start on that? I mean, in terms of um, infrastructure sharing, the, the, the model benefits um, having more than one tenant, right? Because you increase your revenue over one asset that it's, it's generating a cost. So definitely becoming more savvy in, the, in, in how mobile network operators use the real estate, it, it can address one of the return on investment questions that we have been discussing so far, right? So how do I capitalize on this asset that I own? Well, maybe just look at it, at sharing it and, and offer it in, in, in a neutral host type of, of model, right? Um, but the, the point is also that mobile network operators, as, as, as you said, it, they're not only the only ones that own real estate towards the edge. And we are seeing now how, for example, government has got into this, the, the digital connectivity infrastructure acceleration program, uh, trying to get public sector to offer their assets to be used also for edge compute platforms and so on and so forth and, and also to, to use even mount antennas and, 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 and become tower costs. So we, we see that there is a lot more competition as well coming into the, the infrastructure sharing model towards the edge and, and leveraging all of those assets to, to, to build networks. So, the, the, there is a lot that, that the telcos can do by, by leveraging that infrastructure and offering it as a service. Because as uh, you know, Hanan was saying, these networks of networks, it is a reality. Uh, they exist and, and, and they will continue to grow. So yeah, wh why not leverage that and, and, and create a, a business model out of it? Okay. Um uh, Mirko Voltolini from, from Colt had uh, uh, some thoughts on that. So uh, let's bring uh, his next clip in uh, on this, uh, the topic of uh, real estate and how it might be used or what's going on with it. Other things happening here, especially looking at uh, 5G and uh, new wireless technologies, uh, street furniture, uh, buildings, uh, uh, rooftops, uh, Availability and ownership of those uh, real estate locations uh, will be quite quite important, uh, especially in the cities where there is a the need to have dense uh, coverage. Uh, from the cost standpoint, I think we have a significant uh, opportunity on leveraging the 
assets uh, of uh, our customers. So the actual buildings, we are connected to about 30,000 buildings. And so being present there is, uh, is quite a, a good capability for COVID. Okay, so for, for some of the, you know, uh, uh, long-standing uh, national operators, they had a lot of res real estate. Companies that have come along in the last 30 years might not have that. So Colt is maybe looking at, you know, using some of the real estate of the, the companies and the buildings it connects to uh, and, and utilizing that. Um, how important is, and street furniture, I just love that, that terminology. I, I don't like to go through a conference without it being used at least once. But is this, how important is the, the ownership of, of when we get like really, really close within urban areas, the, uh, the lampposts, the, the old telephone boxes that, that might be used to put a small cell on top? How important are these uh, physical assets, this real estate, uh, to delivering um, the, the, the services that we hope 5G might be delivered? Or is this just something that's good on paper? Well, I mean, to, to me, there's, there's a continuum of applications in terms of their demand for low latency. You know, there are some applications that demand super low latency where you've got to be very, very close to the edge. And th those are currently being served primarily by private 5G networks. Then, you know, at the other end of the scale, there are applications that are perfectly happy with, with 15, 20 milliseconds round trip time that in many countries can be just hosted in public hyperscale cloud. Now, there's, there's probably some middle ground. And, you know, the, all the hyperscalers have announced uh, like scaled down versions of their core clouds that can be deployed either on telco premises or, you know, in, in, in metro areas. There hasn't yet been a huge rollout of that. And I, and I think the reason for that is because the industry generally still isn't all that terribly sure about what the drivers are going to be. And, you know, build it and they will come is not really a very, uh, you know, for the sort of money we're talking about here, these, these, these are potentially huge investments. Hmm. Now, whether, the, 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 whether those facilities go into telco premises or not, I think it's a purely tactical question. Uh, you know, you need space to put a few racks of equipment. The telco happens to have a CO. Great. Um, maybe it can go there. But I, I don't see the, the real estate issues as being fundamentally, uh, you know, strategic concern to the industry. It's just tactical convenience where, where stuff goes, uh, as long as it's close enough to support the application, uh, you know, to the end user population. I, I think it's, it's not about the amount of real estate, it's the quality of the real estate. Where is it located? And I believe in, even doesn't matter too much where it is located. It's, what is the connectivity that I have on that location? If I have microseconds, milliseconds latency to get that and I have enough bandwidth, I can serve whole London from there, independently is it the north or the, or the south, whatever it is, right? So, and this is one of the important things that they need to, they need to, to drive, say, what are the locations that are meaningful for me? And what are the locations where I'm gonna be actually deploying infrastructure? And the, the, the interesting thing is that today, the operators have all the technology, that, the, all the technology is available there to transform any CO, any head-end okay, into an edge location and provide infrastructure to host their own platform and to host somebody else's platform in there too. Is everything is in there, they need to plan, they need to understand what is will be most, of more value for them on all that real estate that they have. What is, one thing that's important is they need to build the connectivity between those locations so that they can serve those low latency and the high bandwidth that they're gonna need there. Yeah, well, I mean, certainly the trend, sorry, Paul, go ahead. Oh, no, it's fine. Uh, I was just gonna briefly comment. I think, you know, what Maria mentioned was really true that you look at tenancy, you look at multi-tenancy within these, these environments. You, you wanna make sure from a TCO perspective that where you do have real estate, and real estate is incredibly expensive, right? It's one of the most expensive components of building a network, uh, that you support multi-tenancy, and especially uh, at that facility, but within the technology itself as well, because you need to drive efficiency in the use of the infrastructure. And if you can host other carriers that are trying to simultaneously use the infrastructure or other applications riding on that same infrastructure without having to stand up a replicated set of infrastructure to host that application, you're driving efficiency and reducing use of real estate and driving down the cost of the network. Yeah, and that's, and that's what we're seeing. And that's what's driven, I think, a lot of the, uh, um, the economic uh, decisions in the, in the past couple of yeah. years um, with the uh, mobile mast infrastructure being um, spun off so that it can, it, it can be used in, in different ways. 
Um, okay, well, we are coming up very close to time, and I know we definitely want to, to keep on, on schedule here. So um, I think we're going to just close out this session now by uh, uh, coming to the uh, poll results and see how uh, people uh, out in the broader telecom TV community and the people uh, in here have been voting. So if we can uh, uh, take a look at the, the results we've been seeing. So the question was, for which of these functions and or applications is edge computing best suited? Uh, well, I think uh, we haven't seen anything above 50% yet today, but low latency IoT applications uh, so 73% of, of people who've taken the poll uh, chose that as, uh, as something uh, that is for its best suited, and that makes an awful lot of sense. And actually, quite a few of the options here are getting quite high scores. Uh, 5G radio access network, RAN functions, 50%. That's interesting. That's higher than uh, right now than what I would have thought. And right down at the bottom end of the scale, 5G call functions, very low on 14%. Uh, and general enterprise applications. So uh, an interesting mix of, of stats there, but clearly low latency I, IT, IoT applications is the one that is making uh, most sense for the people that have voted. So uh, please do continue to vote in these polls. Um, it'll be uh, uh, interesting for us to see how, how these figure out, uh, how the voting patterns go, and we can uh, fit that, uh, these results into our post-show uh, analysis. Uh, so we need to leave it there. Refreshments are being uh, served in the, in the lobby again. Again, uh, the Led Zeppelin pinball machine is going to be fired up. Uh, so if you need a bit of a, a musical interlude uh, before the final session, that's the place to go. Uh, remember to sign up and make your charity contribution because it's about that as well as having some fun. And we'll see you back here at 4.20 uh, for the final session of today. Uh, but to close out, let's have a big hand for our guest speakers here today and their contributions. Thank you. <laughs>